Hey, thanks for joining us online today. My name is Pastor Chris and I serve here at Hope Church as one of the worship pastors. If you've been watching online, then you know that in the past we've offered both music and the message in the online service. But as we strive to move forward for future growth here at Hope Church, we're going to be forced to make some changes. Part of those changes in require us to pick up some new gear and with supply chain being backed up the way it is, some of those changes are gonna take a little bit of time. And so for the short term, what we're gonna be offering online is just the message. And eventually we hope to get to a little bit more engaging time online with you. But for now, we're gonna encourage you to continue to jump in online for the message. We encourage you to download the Hope Church app so that you can have the notes with you and your Bible and we can engage together as we study the Bible and as we learn to love God more and love others better. And so if you would, let's grab our Bible, let's grab our church app, and let's jump into the Word together. Welcome to Hope Church. We are so thankful that you have chosen to join with us today. Whether you are gathered here in the worship center uh, this morning or you are gathered at our North Campus in ASEAN, we are so thankful that you have chosen to brave the weather today and to come in person. For those of you who are at home, maybe you're traveling and you're watching us online, we want to thank you for being a part of what God is doing here as Hope Church as we continue in our series today in John chapter 14. And so if you have your Bibles, turn with me into John chapter 14 uh, as we continue in this series, really understanding that this is the way forward. This is the way forward. Jesus is laying the groundwork for his disciples as, pre as he's preparing to leave this earth. Now, some of you may recognize the name uh, Florence Chadwick. Florence Chadwick was a famous American swimmer. Uh, she became the first woman to swim the English Channel both directions, and she also attempted uh, in, during her career to swim from Catalina Island to all the way to the coastline of California. Now, what made her attempt especially newsworthy was the reason she was not able to make that swim between the island and the coast of California. It was not the cold water of the Pacific Ocean that did her in. It wasn't muscle cramps that finally took over. It was not even a shark or a school of jellyfish that caused her demise during that trip, or even the exhaustion of 16 hours of swimming. The reason that she didn't make it was because she was unable to see the coastline of California because the fog had settled in. When she climbed into the boat, finally giving up, she was informed that she had less than one mile to complete the swim. She was one mile away from the shore. But the fog had rolled in and she had lost her direction, she had lost her hope, she had lost her perspective of where she was and where the goal was. She lost her confidence. The fog brought it with it all sorts of insecurities, all sorts of doubts, and all sorts of fears. The fog had distorted her 
thinking, in her beliefs, and she could no longer see how she was going to make her way forward. It's very possible that given the time and the day and the season and all the news that is around us, that uh, you may be feeling the same way. Like the fog has settled in, it's rolled in, and you can no longer see the shore. You can no longer see clearly what was once in front of you. What once was clear is no longer clear. And so the question for us to think through during our time together is, what do we do when it's hard to see? What do we do when it becomes hard to see? Going back to the story of Florence Chadwick, what do you do when the fog rolls in? What do you do when that fog begins to settle in and you lose your sense of direction, you lose your sense of hope. I want to give credit for inspiration for this message from a book that was written by Kyle Eidelman called, titled Don't Give Up. Incredible read, a incredible book about how we navigate in life's challenges. As Jesus sits down with his disciples here in John chapter 14, he knows that it's becoming harder, harder to see. He knows that just within the next several hours, it's going to become almost impossible for them to see and make their way forward. In the days ahead, that fog is going to settle in and it's going to be dense. It's going to be thick. And Jesus knows that in this moment, he doesn't have much time left with his disciples. But he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of his disciples. He's thinking of those who are to come. He even thinks of you and I by the time we end his prayer in John 17, his closest followers. And so he's preparing his closest followers, his disciples, in these moments for what is coming, for when it's going to get to be hard to see. And he wants to make sure that they are going to keep their eyes focused and fixed on what he's come to share and the one who sent him to earth to begin with. And so in case any of you have doubts about who he is, he's going to be really clear in this conversation with them. And we pick it up in verse 7, John 14, 7. If you really know me, you will know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus says in verse 9, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been with you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, Philip is essentially saying, look, if you want us to have faith in the midst of everything that's going on, if you want us to have faith that deals with what is coming our way, then let us see God with our own eyes. Let us see him with our own eyes. And Jesus says to Philip, hey, what do you think you've been a part of for the last three years? I have revealed the Father to you over and over and over again in the last three years. You've seen God for the last three years because you have seen me. I and the Father are one. Speaking to Philip, he says, how can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? Jesus goes on to say, remember the words that I've spoken to you, Philip. Remember the words. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. You see how Jesus continues to repeat this idea. I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe the evidence of the works themselves. And I think this is really important. Believe it when I say, so he's saying, Philip, believe what I say. But if that isn't enough, at least believe in the evidence of the works that you have seen. At least we believe in the evidence of the works that you have seen me do while I am in your midst. Believe what I say, or at least believe in the signs and the wonders that you have seen, the works that I have done. Philip, 
Jesus says, remember what I've said to you. Remember what you've seen with your own eyes. Remember what you've witnessed. Don't lose your faith and give up. Keep your eyes focused on me and just keep moving forward. And sometimes that's exactly all we need to hear. Keep our eyes focused on Jesus and just keep moving forward. Don't lose your faith. Don't give up. Just keep moving forward. And this is how followers of Jesus respond when we can't find the way, when we can't see the way. We do not lose perspective and panic. We continue to move forward with faith, believing that, if, that Jesus is there and he's not going to fail us. Even though we can't see right now, even though the fog has maybe has settled in and we can't sense him, we can't see him right now, we just keep our eyes fixated on the prize, as Paul talks about, and we keep moving forward. Philip, remember the words that I have spoken. In the middle of this fog, stop and listen for my voice. Stop and listen to my voice. And what Jesus was doing is Jesus was constantly reassuring his followers of his identity that he is God, that he is God. He is God, and he was constantly reminding them of that. The Gospel of John records seven statements that Jesus makes about his identity. They are known as the seven I am statements. I am. Now, up to this point in John chapter 14, Jesus has already revealed six of the seven. Some of you will remember in the Old Testament, uh, when God told Moses his name was uh, what his name was, God said to Moses, my name is I am. Well, who sent, me? who sent me? Tell them I am sent you. Tell the people I am sent you to lead them out. And so in Judaism, the words I am are understood to be the name of God. They're understood to be the name of God. This means that every time Jesus makes this I am statement, these I am statements, what he is basically saying in a very subtle, not so subtle claim is he is saying, I am God. I am God. I and the Father are one. I am in the Father. The Father is in me. And so each one of these I am statements remind us of who Jesus is and what it means for us when it becomes hard to see. The first one that Jesus reveals shows up in John chapter 6. The crowd is hungry, and they are wanting Jesus to provide food for them supernaturally. And Jesus, in fact, has already fed thousands of them. And now they come back, and they're ready for more, and they're saying, Jesus, provide us some food. And here's what Jesus says to them. I am the bread of life. I am the bread the bread of life. Do you remember that, Philip? Do you remember that statement? Do you remember what I said to them? Remember when I spoke those words? They came looking for food, but in this statement, Jesus describes himself as the bread of life that would satisfy their very souls. And Jesus reminds us, when it's hard to see, there will be times when we ask ourselves, Who's going to provide for me today? Who's going to give me what I need for today? Who's going to satisfy me for today? Who's going to be there to care for my needs today? In this statement, Jesus says, I am. I am the bread of life. I'm going to take care of your basic needs I'm going to give you life and give you life abundant. The second I am statement comes in John chapter 8, and Jesus says this, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. This statement comes just before Jesus heals a man who was born blind. His whole life has been darkness, and Jesus comes in as the light of the world, and he gives light to this man. 
He gives him the eyes to see. Philip, do you remember when that happened? Do you remember when that took place? Do you remember that I am the light of the world? And so Philip, whenever you find yourself asking, who is going to show me the way? Who is gonna light the path for me? Who's gonna light the way forward? I am, because I am the light of the world, Jesus says. When there doesn't seem to be any way forward and it just seems to be too dangerous to keep going forward, who's gonna provide the light that can take us to the next step and the next step and to continue moving forward? Jesus says, I am, because I am the light of the world. Another statement that Jesus makes is in John chapter 10, verse 9. He says, I am the door. I am the door. And in this statement, Jesus is explaining that no one can enter the kingdom of heaven on their own merit. Like you just can't find your way there. You can't earn your way there. You can't do it in and of yourself because Jesus is the door. I am the door and you enter the kingdom of heaven through me. There's only one way, and I am the way. I am the door. So when you get turned around and you've lost your way and you find yourself asking, who is who's going to get me out of here? Like, who's gonna get me out of here? How, how, can I, how can I understand where I'm going and what is going to be in the future? How am I gonna find my way from here to there? Jesus says, I am. Because I am the door. I am the door. The fourth I am statement also comes in John 10, verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And so when you find yourself asking, well, who's going to protect me? Who's going to watch over me? Who's going to keep me safe? Jesus says, I am. Because I am the good shepherd. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I protect you. I hem you in. I will watch over you. I will protect you from all sides. The fifth I am statement comes from John chapter 11, where Jesus makes this statement just before raising Lazarus from the dead. Lazarus had been dead and buried for several days, and Jesus and his disciples they show up, and it just seems like Jesus is late to the, to the funeral, and yet he comes in, and it seems like there's nothing that can be done, but he's there. Lazarus is in the grave. He's in the tomb, but Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life, and then he raises Lazarus from the dead. And so what it just seems like Jesus is too late to make a difference when it feels like all hope is lost and he's dead and he's buried, when you find yourself asking, well, who's gonna fix this because there's no way that I can fix this. I can't see anyone fixing this. It just seems unfixable. Who can bring life back to your marriage? Who can bring life back to your family? Who can bring life back to this country? Who can bring life back to your soul? Who's going to save the day? Jesus says, I am. Because I am the resurrection and the life. All things are in my control. I am the resurrection and life. And sometimes I think Jesus is just saying here, don't get in my way because this is what I am. And sometimes we get in his way and we don't allow him to do what he is supposed to be doing. One other I am statement that Jesus made just before this passage is in John chapter 14, verse six. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can I just tell you, that this statement alone upsets a lot of people. It upsets a lot of people. And it's very possible that it may even upset you as well. Because you're like, well, there's more than just one way. No, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. 
No one comes to the Father except through me. So why is this so, why is this claim so controversial? What makes it so outrageous? I think it's because it strikes at the core of many of the great myths of religion. It strikes right at the center and the core. We are sinful and God is not. And this creates a distance between us and him. And because God is a righteous judge, our wrongdoing has to be paid for. It has to be paid for. And so out of his love for us, Jesus voluntarily offers himself as our substitute to pay for the penalty of our wrongdoing. In other words, Jesus took all of our sin, all of the punishment that we rightfully deserve, he took the full wrath of God's punishment for our sin. He bore it on the cross. He conquered it through his death, the shedding of his blood, and he claimed victory through his resurrection. And so he's the only one that can say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except for me. He's the only way. He is the only definition of truth. In fact, let me strengthen that statement. He is the very definition of truth. He is truth. Everything is defined by him and through him. In short, other religions spell it D-O, do, because they teach that we have a bunch of things that we have to do. There's a bunch of hoops that we have to go through, a lot of ritualistic, uh, religious rituals to make ourselves pleasing before God. But Christianity, in contrast, is spelled D-O-N-E. It's been done. Why? Because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. As Jesus was about to die on the cross, for the payment of our sins, he said, it is finished. It is done. It's complete. It's paid for. He is saying, I am the only way out of sin. I am the only way out of disappointment and defeat. I am the only way out of trouble in this world. And so when you find yourself lost, and everything seems to be lost around you. Philip, take a breath. Mark, take a breath. And he reminds them. He reminds Philip. He reminds me. He reminds you. Remember what I've promised. Remember the I am statements. And the seventh statement, Jesus makes just after this conversation with Philip, and it's found in John 15, verse 1. He says, I am the true vine. I am the true vine. And here's what Jesus is saying. There's a lot of fake vines out there. There's a lot of, there's a lot of folks, there's a lot of religions that are gonna promise you, they're gonna promise you the world. But I am the true vine. I am the true vine. I love the book of John. Because not only does the book of John reveal the seven I am statements of revealing who Jesus is, his identity, but the book of John goes a little bit further in helping us believe by recording, remember there was the or, believe in what I've said or believe in what you have seen me do, the miracles. And so it gives us the recording of seven signs or evidence that gives us faith and belief. So let me just touch on those quickly. You can just listen to them, or if you just want to madly write them down, it's, it's up to you, all right? The first one is this. Jesus turns water into wine. Jesus turning water into wine shows us that Jesus has the power over small things. Small things. The little things that usually keep us up at night. Like, oh, we're going to run out of this. Or how are we going to be provided for this? It also shows us that Jesus cares about all the little details in our life. There was a book that was out many, 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 it shows my age. 
Don't sweat the little stuff, okay? You know, that was a long time ago. Like, I don't even know if it's in print anymore, okay? But, but Jesus gives us this understanding that by turning water into wine, that we don't sweat the small stuff. That was the title. Don't sweat the small stuff. That we don't sweat the small stuff. Later, Peter later on writes, cast all of your cares or your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. The second thing that we see is that Jesus heals the official son. This shows us that Jesus has power over distance. His power over distance because the son is completely in a different town. But the moment that Jesus speaks healing, the son is healed in a distance. A third sign that we read about is he heals a man who was paralyzed for 38 years. This shows us that Jesus has the power over time. I mean, you've been blind paralyzed, or paralyzed for 38 years. There is nothing that is so done that Jesus cannot undo it. There's nothing so done that he cannot undo it. A fourth sign is he fed the 5,000. This shows us that Jesus has power over our daily needs. And so we pray and we say, give us today our daily bread. Jesus can provide that. A fifth sign that we read about in the Gospel of John is he walks on water. And so we remember that Jesus has the power over nature and over the physical world. A sixth sign is that he heals the blind man. This shows us that Jesus has power over the human body. His power over the human body. And then the seventh sign that we talk about already is he raises Lazarus from the dead. This shows us that Jesus has power over life and death. And so remember, Philip, disciples, Mark, when you're in the midst of the fog, remember what I've said and remember what I've done. Don't forget those things. When you can't see the way forward and you look back and you meditate on the words of Jesus, there's this, there's this simple way of understanding what it means to follow Jesus. And so I've just brought a small little acronym with me that I want to use as just a way to kind of help us focus. Because there are sometimes there are troubles in our life that can be so disorienting, that can create panic and leave us defeated. And so I want to use the word fog. F-O-G. It's an acronym to just be reminded what to do when we're surrounded by the fog. The first thing that we need to do is we need to focus on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Philip, remember what I've said and remember what I've done. Focus on Jesus. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that we run the race marked out before us with perseverance by what? Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And I know that this is not easy at times. At times, sometimes it really, really is hard. And I know that there are times where there's a lot of fog and it becomes easy to get disoriented and get distracted and there's a lot of fighting and our attention loses focus. I don't want to be a Debbie Downer this morning, but we are going to continue to face at an ever-increasing rate fog rolling in over and over and over again. We didn't just survive 2020. 2020 introduced a new speed at which life is going to come at us and change. And it's going to be easy to lose direction in the midst of the fog. It's going to be easy to lose hope in the midst of the fog because the fog's rolling in and it's just, it's coming at warp speed and it's just going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And if we don't fix our eyes on Jesus, we're going to lose hope. We're going to lose hope. 
in the midst of the fog, keep your eyes on Jesus. And for some of you, I just want to applaud you in that. I want to thank you in that because you have not lost focus. You've not gotten off over here and over there. And, and in this world, it's going to be so easy to get mistracked over here and tracked over here. And the moment that we get focused on something over here, what have we done? We've taken our eyes off Jesus. We have to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. And so in the midst of the fog, keep focus on Jesus. And as we talked about in, in preceding weeks, Put our weight on him. I know that one of the simplest ways to stay engaged and to stay connected is to swim together, to encourage one another. Who is it that you're connected to in this season? Who is it that you're swimming next to? Who are you doing life with? And don't underestimate the importance, especially if you're in a season of fog, to stay connected with others. Because when you're in the fog, you keep your eyes focused on Jesus and you get involved in a group or a life study or a life builders class or you, you swim with somebody else. You continue to encourage each other along. The second uh, part of our acronym is offer thanks. So we fix our eyes on Jesus and then we offer thanks. Gratitude has the power to cut through the fog. Thanksgiving and gratitude should be our natural response when we're listening to Jesus talk about who he is, what he's done, and what he's going to prepare for us. We ought to be filled with gratitude. And so Jesus starts this, this conversation just a few verses earlier. We looked at two weeks ago where Jesus reassured us. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in me. And then he goes on and he says, I am going to prepare a place for you. So last week we introduced this whole idea of knowing whose we are and knowing where we're going is going to keep our hearts filled with gratitude. And Jesus says, I have made a way for you when there just seems to be no way I, because I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so what is Jesus doing? He's gone to prepare a place for us. And in our Father's house, there's a room that he has saved for us and our, and our hearts ought to be filled with gratitude because of what he's doing. And yet, by instinct, often what we do is, where, God, where are you? Where are you in the midst of this? He's promised to never leave us or forsake us. He's told us what he's doing, and our hearts ought to be filled with gratitude in the midst. And so if you are in a hard season, it's really, really easy to let our hearts and our minds be overtaken by the fog especially when we are faced with constant uncertainties and very real struggles. And yet as followers of Jesus, we see through the fog because Jesus gives us the ability to see through the fog as we focus on him and we trust in our internal guide, the Holy Spirit, who allows us to see when we cannot see. He gives us hope when we may lose hope because he's our internal compass and guide. He's our navigator. As followers of Jesus, we should be known by a revolutionary spirit of joy and peace that comes from a grateful heart. Why? Because he indwells us. His spirit indwells us. But guess what? We have to fight for it. It doesn't come natural. We have to fight for it. We are not people who panic in the fog because we know who's in control of the fog. We know who's leading us forward. And we are people who praise God in the midst of the fog. And when the fog rolls in, we just keep swimming. We keep swimming. We keep going forward. And so listen, church family. We have a tremendous opportunity to let our light shine in a foggy world. We really do. We have a tremendous opportunity 
to, to not just be separated out and, and go do our own thing, but to, to be separated out and not join in with groupthink and show where our hope is and focus on the one who gives us his hope. This is not a time to let the fog frustrate us and get angry because we are scared or because we don't, we don't know how thing, things are not going according to our plan. This is not a time for us to be afraid because we don't know what's coming. This is a time for us to worship God with grateful hearts because he's already told us the way and he's come to show us the way. And now he indwells us to guide us in the way. And people should see the difference in our lives because of that. The last letter is G. And that is to get an eternal perspective. Jesus is talking to his followers about heaven and he's helping them to see on the other side of the fog. I love the way the message paraphrases 1 Corinthians 13, 12. Here's what it says. We do not, we don't yet see things clearly. We are squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. See it as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly as he knows us. That ought to put it in perspective for us. There will be more fog. There will be more snow, snowstorms. There will be more storms ahead. But in the midst of the fog, we keep perspective by remembering what is on the other side of the fog. If God is all we have, then we have everything we need. If God is all we have in the fog, then we have everything we need. So some of you are thinking, well, what happened to Florence Chadwick? Remember I started with a story about Florence Chadwick, the American swimmer, how she attempted to swim from Catalina Island to the coast of California. But the fog had rolled in, and she could not see land, and so she gave up. Two months later, though, she attempted that same swim again. And again, the fog settled in, and it was heavy, and she could not see the coastline, but this time it was different. This time she finished the swim. Why? What was the difference? Well, this time she was prepared. She was prepared for that fog to roll in. This time when it rolled in, she said she kept a mental image of the shoreline in her mind, and she focused on that. She set her mind on things ahead. I love that image. Why? The Apostle Paul says it. Focus on the goal. I press on to the goal, the mark that is in front of me. Why? Because Jesus is the author and the finisher. And so, friend, let me ask you. In the midst of the fog, what are you going to focus on? Because the fog's going to come, and it's going to continue to come. What is it that we focus on? It's this reminder that Jesus is worthy, and we are needy. And so I want to close our time today by just focusing on that. Two little simple statements. Just in your time with him, just in these moments, I want you to pray. I want you to thank God for who he is. God, you are worthy. And you just finish that statement. You just spend time praising him. And then secondly, invite him in because, God, I am so needy. You are worthy, but I am needy. Let's pray about that, those two things.